Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're gonna have a little bit of fun and go back to the basics. I'm gonna take you through the absolute basic beginner lessons of resin printing. Let's get started. Before we get into the actual tutorial and lesson in this video, I wanna thank our sponsor, 3D.ru. They're an event that's coming up in Europe. It's actually gonna be online, so anyone around the world can join up. And it's a 3D printing event for people all over the world. And here's the deal, it's all about uh, getting better and growing and doing some entrepreneurial stuff with 3D printing. Let's say you're a beginner or maybe an advanced 3D printer and you're wanting to take things to the next level or you wanna to talk to professionals and get some tips and tricks or maybe get your product tested or even try to find funding for your projects. You wanna check out 3D.ru. And there's actually a million dollars in funding up for grabs at this event. Go there, sign up with your project or your uh, different 3D printing activity and get involved. That's 3D.ru. With the recent kind of abundance of super cheap 3D printers out there that I've been seeing pop up. I've been seeing some resin-based printers popping up for $99 out there on the internet. With that cheapness and ubiquitousness, what happens is you get tons and tons of people that uh, will buy one just in case or buy one for a friend. And so there are a lot of people entering into the 3D printing community that don't necessarily know how to operate them. I've personally received three messages of people asking me, why won't the file I downloaded from Thingiverse print on my printer? I put it on the memory card, I put it in the printer, and nothing happens. And this seems like a perfect opportunity to run through the process from beginning to end in the most basic terms to help people figure out how these work so that they can safely use them and get great results and have fun 3D printing. Okay, let's go over the outline of what I'm gonna discuss in this video. First up, what is a resin printer? How does it compare to a filament-based 3D printer? Then we're gonna talk about where to get files for your printer, how to prepare those files for your printer, how to prepare your printer for printing, then after printing, how to finish the print, which is involved with a resin-based printer, and then how to clean out your printer. All right, let's compare a filament-based printer with a resin printer. So over here, we have a filament-based printer. You can pretty much identify them at a glance because they're all gonna have some very similar features. They're going to have an extruder that moves around somehow that's a very hot little nozzle, and they shove filament through that hot nozzle just like a hot glue gun. Then they have a bed that they put the plastic on and they build it up layer by layer. There's different configurations, different price ranges, different sizes, but they all kind of have those same things in common, the, the moving uh, extruder and the use of filament. A resin printer, however, there are various uh, styles, types, and technologies. The one that I'm going to focus on is MSLA. And here's the anatomy of a resin printer. You typically have a, this is the bed, this is where the, the 3D printed part is going to reside, and it is what you would think of as upside down compared to a normal printer. This bed moves up and down. This right here is the reservoir. This is where all of your resin is going to sit. And then below the reservoir, which is clear by the way, you can see some resin in there, you have your screen. Now. There are variations, there are design variations, there's different styles, but they all basically have, all of the MSLA printers basically have a screen, a reservoir, and a bed that moves up and down. Uh, so your, your printer that you got for dirt cheap probably has these same things. So you've got a 3D printer to 3D print stuff, right? But everybody comes to this point and they wonder, where do I get the files to 3D print? There are a couple of options, basically. You can make your own or you can go out and find them 
on the internet. Uh, I'm not going to get into how to model your own files. That's a, that's a big topic that is complicated and takes a lot of practice. Um, but that is one option. The other option, of course, is downloading them off the internet. And there are so many places where you can get files. And people put files out there for free that you can download and print on your machine. Uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff out there. A few places to look would be thingiverse.com. That's a probably the biggest file repository out there. It's probably the oldest as well, but a few others have come up and grown up uh, over the past few years. There's Prusa Printers, uh, which is actually the manufacturer of both of these printers. Um, there's Umagine, which I believe is connected to Ultimaker. Uh, Thingiverse, I didn't mention earlier, is connected to MakerBot. Um, and then there are some, some search engine style ones that search through all of them. I believe one of them is called Yegi. I'm going to put the names of a few of the search engine style ones in the description below because I can't remember them off the top of my head. So now you've downloaded your file or modeled your own file and it's what's called an STL file. That's a model. That's the 3D shape and, you know, broken down into programming languages or whatever. The fact is, though, your printer doesn't know what to do with that. So you have to put it in something called a slicer. That's a piece of software that creates all the layers based off of the 3D information. This right here is Prusa Slicer. It's the slicer that I use for my resin printer. Uh, one of the more common ones that you'll see out there is called Cheetu Box, and a lot of the ones you see for manufacturers are actually even based off of the Cheetu Box uh, slicer. But basically, it's a piece of software that you load your model into, and it creates the layers based off of the 3D information so that your printer knows what to do. This is also where you'll do things like change the quality based off of uh, the layer thicknesses and things like the amount of time that each layer is exposed to light. And you'll find those settings are important for different resins. So if you get a resin that needs longer curing times, it'll usually say somewhere on the bottle or on their website, and you can adjust those things in the slicer. The slicer then, once you have your model, let me load a model. Once you have your model loaded and you've changed your settings to be how they need to be, that includes things like the quality, but also things like supports. If your model needs supports for areas that are maybe going to be printed out in midair, then you hit the slice button. Most of these all have a slice button and that creates what's called G code or for some uh, resin printers, they call it something else. Uh, the file suffix is something other than G-code. Uh, but basically, it's all the, the code that your printer needs to know to print the file. You spit that out onto a USB stick or a memory card, depending on your resin printer. Now we get to the fun part where things start to get dirty. You've got your printer, hopefully you took it out of the box and followed the instructions for the initial calibration. That's things like getting the bed set up properly and uh, you know getting all the pieces in the right places. You should already have done that and it's a little bit different for each machine. But for printing, what you're going to find is that each machine usually has a maximum level on the reservoir that you can fill it to. You want to do that with the bed out of the tank. You fill it up to that maximum level. Then you insert your memory stick with the special code on it that tells your printer what to do and tell it to print. That's really about it as far as getting your printer ready to go. It handles the rest. Kind of keep an eye on it to make sure it's printing. It's frustrating with resin printers because you don't know immediately if your print has failed until it's gotten about this far into the print. Uh, but once you've verified that it's printing fine, you leave it alone until it's done. All right, now your print is done, except it's all gloopy and gross and slimy and frankly, toxic. 
Now, if you're printing on a regular filament-based printer, you could call it done at this point. You can pop something off of a regular printer's uh, print bed and just have it and be done with it and hold it, you know, no issues. But this is still covered in uncured resin and needs to be cleaned. To clean a resin printed part, you're gonna need to use isopropyl alcohol. Sometimes people just refer to it as IPA. You can buy this at your local uh, hardware store. It's good to look for 99% isopropyl alcohol. If you go to a grocery store even, you can find uh, rubbing alcohol in places, but look at the bottle real close because some of them will be like 50% or something like that. The higher the percentage of alcohol, the better. Though the others will work in a pinch. There are some resins <clears throat> that are water soluble, but that's a little bit more complicated because you ideally don't want to be washing them down the drain in your sink. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that for a later video. For now, all you need to know is that you have to clean your print. Now, uh, you can just take your print out and dump it in a jug of isopropyl alcohol, scrub it off, and then cure it. There's a second curing stage that comes after printing it. To cure it, I will be using a curing station. I'll get into that in a moment, but you really could just set it out in the sun. The UV rays from the sun will cure it eventually, or you can buy a UV light. This is what I used before I had a curing station. It's just a high power UV light in the right uh, frequency. And um, I just set the part in front of this on a little turntable and let it cure for a few hours. Now, since then, I've gotten a curing station. These are getting to be more and more common. I've seen them as cheap as $100. And even I saw one with a coupon yesterday that went down to $50 for a curing station. This is the Prusa Wash and Cure, which means it does both washing and curing. This is a tub of uh, IPA. And what this will do is I'll throw the part in here. It will use magnets to stir it and wash it. And then I will take this whole assembly apart and cure it. Different people will tell you different orders to do things and you really just have to figure out what you like to do on your own. This is just finished washing for the first time. And what I like to do is wash it, take it out and pull off the supports and maybe clean up some spots that need to be ground down a little bit, wash it again, set it out and let it fully dry and then cure it. So let's just take a look at this after the first washing. <clears throat> now this is a fairly uh, delicate print that I modeled and normally what I would do is come in with tweezers or needle nose pliers and very delicately remove these supports. But for the sake of this video, I won't make you sit through that. What I will do is just carefully snap them off with my finger here, even if it's gonna cause some of this very delicate file to be maybe a little damaged. And you can see they come off fairly easily for the most part. And then what I do is I wash it again to get uh, any of the resin that was kind of trapped by the supports and I let it fully dry before I cure it. Now that step of letting it fully dry, I do because if I cure it while it's still wet like this, it's kind of hard to see that on camera, I get kind of white splotches where any little puddles of uh, alcohol and resin might have been. So that's why I let it dry fully before I cure it. So we did one wash, Remove the supports, I'm gonna do another wash. It's, it's absolutely up to you whether or not that's the method you want to employ. And then I will cure it in the, in the UV light. Here you can see what this wash station is doing. There's magnets in there that are spinning a stirrer inside here that's causing turbulence in the uh, alcohol to clean it off. I think wash and cure stations are fantastic. Uh, like I said, there's a few different brands you can get um, but I highly recommend them if you're going to get a resin-based 3D printer. All right, time to cure the part. So there are several ways to cure your part. Like I was saying before, 
If you don't have a uh, washing and curing station, you can just use a UV light and a turntable. I got this little solar turntable on Amazon. You put your part on there and you turn on your light. Uh, <clears throat> it should be strong enough to power the turntable. Put this inside of a cardboard box lined with aluminum foil to bounce the light around and leave it for an hour or something. It doesn't have to be real scientific. I don't use this method anymore because I got curing stations. So let's do that method. Now watch out, this is UV light. It could be harmful to your eyes uh, and skin with long exposures. So, you know, don't sit around staring at your UV light. With a curing station, they all kind of work very similarly where you put your part in it. It's got a turntable, it's got UV lights in it. You tell it to go and you can't really see from there. You might be able to see a little bit of a glow around the edge here. Yeah, there's a UV light in there curing the part. After it's cured, you're done. Unless you, of course, want to then finish the part by, you know, sanding it and painting it and stuff like that. All right, the last step is extremely important and probably the least fun, and that's cleaning your machine. You don't have to do this after every print. If you're gonna be doing a bunch of prints with the same material, you can do them one after another. But I do recommend you clean out your machine somewhat frequently because it will uh, save you some heartache if you're encountering some problems. To clean out your machine, generally what I mean is you need to dump the resin out of the vat and clean the, the reservoir. This also gives you an opportunity to inspect your FEP foam. Now, ideally you would have a mesh uh, filter of some kind and a funnel. This is a funnel I 3D printed and I just rearranged my shop and can't find my filters, so this time I'm doing it without a filter. Uh, you pour your resin back in. Watch out, you can make a horrible mess doing this. And then what you're going to do is use, uh, ideally, some soft shop wipes to wipe this out. Spray it with isopropyl alcohol and wipe it out. If you use a rough material, like a standard paper towel, what you'll find is that you're scratching up your FEP foam. That's this clear material here. The FEP foam will get scratched up and degrade over time if you use rough materials. It'll probably degrade over time anyway, but it'll last longer if you use softer shop towels. This also gives you an opportunity to inspect for pinholes. I recommend after you drain it and wipe it down, you hold up a strong light behind it and move it around and see if you can find any pinholes. A tiny little pinhole will leak resin onto your screen and that will ruin your entire day and possibly your entire machine. <clears throat> Also pay attention when you're filming videos because this bed is over here dripping right onto my screen and I'm going to scream. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you learned something. If you've got any more tips for beginners, be sure to leave them in the comments down below and, you know, be helpful to the, the 3D printing community that's just coming on board. Welcome them into your arms. Uh, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more.